Hi everyone, welcome to the Physionic Podcast. If you are just uh, first encountering the Physionic Podcast, then you may not be familiar with who I am. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD student in molecular medicine. I have my master's in exercise physiology. And today, although I usually say that I have an interesting paper, I always say that there's an interesting paper with every paper that I cover. Uh, this time I have a fantastic guest with me that I'm really excited to bring back onto the podcast for at least the third time, maybe the fourth time. One time we sure. knocked out uh, two different two different papers on the same day. So I'm going to count those as two separate ones. Um, so for the fourth time on the podcast, my dear friend, Alec Shaves. So Alec, do you want to uh, discuss a little bit about your background? And then uh, also, before we get into the meat of the subject, which I'll discuss in just a little bit, also talk to us a little bit about um, what you've got going on, like podcasts and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. So, um, as Nick said, my name is Alec. Uh, I am a fourth year PhD student at, in, at East Carolina University in the uh, bioenergetics and exercise science, or getting it in bioenergetics and exercise science. Um, prior to that, I was a I finished my master's at the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and prior to that, I finished my undergraduate at uh, Salisbury University. Um, so recently, here in quarantine times. Um, me and my buddies from the, that I that I met while at um, in Chicago, uh, we decided to start up our own little podcast uh, called the Physiology Forum, and we cover very similar topics, but we do a, a few different. We've done a few different series now, um, so we've done an aging series, um, an obesity series. Now we're at a bariatric ser uh, surgery series, and we pretty much try to cover the most relevant papers that exist in those fields or um, in those different areas. Um, every two weeks that we, we try to get on and we've actually, uh, been lucky enough to get some expert guests on. Um, so Dr. Linus Stone, who's an expert in, uh, bariatric surgery. Um, and then we've also got a bariatric surgeon from one of the recent papers as well, uh, to join us for an interview. Um, and pretty much we are open on all different platforms, Spotify, um, Podbean, um, Apple podcasts and uh, a few others, I iTunes as well, but a few others. Um, so pretty much wherever you can go to um, search your podcast, we should be there. And it is the physiology form. So feel free to, to tune in um, to those as well. Yeah, sounds great. Actually, I'll have that uh, linked for everyone as well. So they can just uh, click on the link and, and subscribe if they want to. Yeah, it's yeah. it's really good. I've listened to quite a few episodes. And I mean, just having experts on in general is a, is a really cool opportunity. So yeah. uh, it's it's definitely nice to see. Okay. Uh, well, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about creatine, which is the topic that a lot of people ask me about. Actually, a lot of my videos that have become relatively popular, you know, relative in my, in, in physionic have been related to creatine actually. Um, so this particular topic is going to be, I think, really interesting, uh, for a lot of different individuals. But I think what What's really interesting about this topic specifically is the fact that we're not going to be talking about creatine and muscle, which was what most people talk about creatine. Uh, you know, one gets swole, so they, they, they start supplementing with creatine. So we're going to be talking about creatine uh, in fat tissue and also more specifically talking about the metabolism that's related to fat tissue and creatine and kind of the association there. It's a really interesting paper. Alec was the one that found this and sent it to me for something that we could cover. So that's what we're going to go through. Uh, if you are just listening to the podcast, uh, <laughs> we're going to try and keep things as, I mean, obviously scientific, but we're going to try and keep things as how do you say, Alec, uh, not overwhelmingly, scientifically, terminologically, <laughs> right. I think uh, digestible. Di di word. Digestible. Thank you. Yeah. yeah we're going to try and keep things digestible. So I might repeat a few things that Alec says. Alec might repeat a few things that I say, just so you have different ways of hearing it. Um, if you are just listening to this, I certainly encourage that you also check out the visual version because I will have a few graphics to, to help people out um, understand different concepts. But we're not going to go into the nitty gritty of every single graph. 
of the paper. We're going to kind of kind of hit all the big points because we've already discussed kind of the nitty gritty so that you can get a detailed explanation without getting bogged down with too much science or too much data, I should say. It's all science. Okay, so without further ado, let's go into this particular paper, creatine fat and metabolism. It's going to be really interesting. So to start out, uh, I'm actually going to, we're going to kind of bounce around and we're going to talk generally about kind of energy in and energy out. So Alec, do you want to kind of talk a little bit about that and kind of the different compartments therein? Sure. Uh, so the, the major components to maintaining or yeah, and, and regulating body composition, right? So our, our weight, uh, lean body mass, uh, fat mass, things like that are uh, dictated primarily by uh, energy and energy out. So whenever we talk about weight loss, for example, and uh, for clinical populations, um, despite the fact there is a uh, abundance of people trying to sell skinny teas and all these different things in which you can bypass this basic bioenergetic concept, um, it can it does not happen, right? So basic body composition, basic bioenergetics and thermodynamics tell us that the um, that our weight is dictated by the energy we consume versus the energy or the sorry, the energy that we take in versus the energy that we uh, burn off or the energy in versus energy out. Um, and there's a few different. So just based on how our society works, right, and 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 the um, and the general abundance and readily available food that we have, it's very difficult um, for a lot of clinical populations to regulate food intake as, as much um, as we were able to do in the past. Um, so there's a, a large interest in trying to figure out ways in which we can increase energy expenditure almost by artificial means. Um, so there's been this, this idea of creating this um, exercise mimetic or this, this exercise in a pill. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been, um, so I guess before we really kind of go into into the nitty gritty, we, we first need to lay out what plays into energy expenditure, right? So, um, yeah. yeah, so the, so the, there's generally a few different ways and, and, and those are the, there's a few different routes uh, in which you can expend energy. Uh, so exercise is a big one of them. Um, there is the uh, neat, so non-exercise, like, physical activity type of thing. So spontaneous uh, physical activity is another one. Uh, our basal metabolic rate, so just the energy we need to consume to maintain life, uh, so just at rest. Um, and then there is also the thermal effect of food. So just eating in general generates um, or expends some energy. Um, so these, in humans at least, these are the ways in which we can expend, expand, exp expend hmm. energy. Um yeah. And there's going to be a specific component of that that we'll talk about today. Um, but yeah, for, for the purposes of, of today's talk, that's, that's generally what we look at when we talk about energy expenditure. Yeah, great. Um, so just to go back real quick. So w when we're talking about spontaneous energy, we're talking about uh, anything that's like fidgeting or kind of moving around, yeah, keeping it. Non-planned yeah. activity. Yes. Not that's yeah. That, I think that's a great way to put it. Non-planned activity, um, BMR. So basal metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate, however you want, want to call it, um, that's the majority of our metabolism. Then that physical act, that uh, non-exercise activity, uh, thermogenesis, which is that spontaneous uh, activity that we were just talking about, that makes up the second largest part. And then the thermic effect of food is that third uh, part. Okay, so great. And we'll, we'll be touching on that kind of as we go throughout. Um, so another thing that this paper looks at is different types of adipose tissue. And if you're watching this, uh, watching the podcast, you can see uh, the different types of adipose tissue that we're going to be talking about. Um, so we've got white fat, we've got beige fat, and we've got brown fat. And this white fat is what we are most accustomed to. So if you're thinking about like gaining weight, uh, then typically you're getting fat molecules that get stored in that white fat tissue or uh, white adipocytes. Those are the same thing. Um, and then 
there's brown fat on the extreme, on the other extreme, um, which is actually found more in animals. And I'll, I'll let Alec actually touch more on that as well, because he, he knows more on this subject. So, um, but you've got brown fat and the distinction between the two on those two extremes is that brown fat tends to have more mitochondria. And that's going to be really important uh, as we go through this paper, because creatine is going to have an impact specifically on this middle fat, which is beige fat, which is uh, something that, well, you know what, I will let uh, Alec discuss kind of that transition between white fat and beige fat and kind of brown fat and whatnot. So go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so, um, yeah, great intro with, um, so the thing, so originally when they started looking at brown fat, they found that there was a, gr uh, a good deal of it that existed in mice. And what they found is that there was a very intricate mitochondrial network that existed in this brown fat. But what was interesting about it is that, so our mitochondria are the, the original, so when you, when you go to your high school bio, biology classes, what do they call it? The, the powerhouse of the cell. They produce this molecule called ATP that's used to allow your cell to do work. So it allows your muscles to contract. Um, it allows your livers to be able to metabolize nutrients, various other things, right? So, um, but what was interesting about the mitochondria they found in the brown fat uh, in mice is that it actually wasn't used to generate ATP. Very little of the substrates or the food stuff that we had that, that went into the brown adipo or into this brown fat was used to create ATP, but rather it was used to um, generate heat. So the, the, the work that was done or that, was, um, that resulted from the energy that the, that the brown fat consumed was mainly used to produce heat. And the reason why this is especially important for mice and even small rodents is because they have a very difficult ability. They, have, they don't have a great ability to uh, maintain thermal neutrality, right? It takes them, um, they have to produce a lot of heat in order for them not to freeze to death. Um, obviously for humans, that's not the case. So this, and that kind of brought into question the relevance of this brown fat literature because of the fact that humans, unless you were talking about infants, don't really have a lot of brown fat. Mm -hmm. But what humans do have is this beige fat that's actually found in, de in, in white adipose tissue depots. Um, and it was thought that the beige fat was a transition point between the white and the brown. Um, but actually, one of the things they talk about in this paper is that there seems to be a very distinct phenotype that exists in beige fat that differentiates it from the brown fat. And oh, considering okay. beige fat... What, one second. Sorry. What, 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 how would you define a phenotype? Sorry. So a phenotype is essentially the appearance, right? Okay. So it can be anything from the appearance, so like what it looks like to the functionality, um, what is responsible for uh, the different characteristics of its metabolism, of its morphology, like just all the things that um, that we can analyze from a scientific standpoint. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So, so where I was going with that was that the beige, so be, considering they have two distinct phenotypes, the beige fat was a was a little bit more of had a, had a much more clinical relevance being that it's actually found in humans and can be found to a larger extent than that of the brown fat that I talked about previously. Um, and that, that's kind of what they mentioned in this paper because there was a, um, there was a protein that was originally discovered to be highly expressed in brown fat. And that was thought to be what was controlling the brown tissue adipogenesis. And that was UCP one. So uncoupling protein one, um, and the reason it's called that is because it actually uncouples the energy metabolism that exists in the mitochondria so that it cannot be used for ATP production, but rather used for heat production, right? And what they found is that that actually is not responsible for the beijing of white adipose tissue. So there is something else that seems to be driving this beige uh, adipose tissue phenotype, which is really what they want to get at here. Right. So what's responsible? What's going on in that beige adipose tissue that separates it from the brown adipose tissue, which, again, has less clinical relevance when talking about humans? OK, so then in, in this paper, then they're going to try and find out what's kind of that transition or what's so important between um, yeah, the white adipose to tissue and the between both of those two different, different like tissue depots. Exactly. Okay, 
Okay, so we've we've hit on energy expenditure, we've hit on fat, kind of the differences yep. in fat, um, although I'm sure there are many, many differences that we're, we're just not aware of um, as a scientific community between yep. these, these different types of fat. But now, before we go into the actual kind of the summaries of the data, um, yep. let's talk a little bit about, let's go inside the cell, let's kind of discuss how creatine could be playing a role in inside the cell, in the mitochondria, like why, you know, everybody's always talking about creatine in the context of muscle. It just allows you to do an extra repetition in the gym. So why would we care about what's happening in, in the fat cell? Yeah. So let's break down creatine just a little bit further. Um, so creatine is just a molecule that's produced by the liver readily. It's so there's an endogenous, so the, the stuff that our body can produce. And then obviously there's a supplement that we can take to get more creatine in. And there's a lot of ergogenic, like athletic benefits of creatine. Um, and one of, so there is, there's evidence to suggest that it can, you know, with resistance training can help improve your gains in muscle mass. Um, and one of the reasons it's thought to do this is because the, when your muscle takes in creatine, so we'll start there. So when the muscle takes in creatine, um, it can actually be used, right? So there's, there's a mechanism in which the, um, the, the ATP that we can, that we, that we produce that last phosphate that exists, that what's considered the high energy phosphate can be transported over to creatine to create this new molecule known as phosphocreatine. Now, in conditions in which you say, for example, go on a sprint, right, in which you like are using energy very quickly and you need to be able to replenish it very quickly, that phosphocreatine, that, 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 that the phosphate that's on creatine can then be used to regenerate um, the ADP or a, the ATP that's being consumed. Right. So it's a very quick energy source that we have. Um, so as I mentioned before, as I just mentioned there, the um, so there's a mechanism that exists in the mitochondria by which ATP that is produced right can then be transferred. That last phosphate can be transferred to creatine to produce phosphocreatine. So that future physical activity um, or the the initiation of future physical activity, we can use that phosphocreatine as that immediate immediate energy source, right? That's okay. generally what and and so the thought being is that. Um, if you can increase this, the amount of phosphocreatine that your muscles have, right, and if you're doing high intensity work that requires that immediate energy source, um, you can theoretically perform like short term high intensity activity for longer. And a, as a general concept in strength conditioning, if you can perform, um, if you can perform, if you can work harder for longer, then you're going to be the better athlete. Right. You're going to be able to get the better gains. You're going to be able to, you know, increase your hypertrophy to a greater extent, things like that. And that's generally where they thought creatine uh, benefits ended. But in fact, like when we look at, um, you know, ever since then, there's actually been a great, there's been a, um, they've been following it further to figure out that creatine actually can be beneficial for various like neurological disorders, uh, bone mineral composition, um, metabolic disorders as well. And the, the, the mechanisms behind it kind of remain, um, elusive. They don't really know as, as to why that exists. Uh, so it's interesting that they actually bring it up here and it's interesting that that it makes its way into this realm because I think this might also provide insight into what's going on potentially or what creatine supplementation uh, is doing for potentially other tissues as well. Um, so yeah, I, there was a big tangent there. So I got to, you got to figure <laughs> yeah, out. You're good. That was, that was really good. That was really good. Yeah. Where we started to now kind of get it, get back our, I, I guess, get our bearings into how we, how we can get back in the paper. Okay. But ultimately we're saying that creatine was focused on muscle and now it's kind of stretched yes. out to now, other tissues. Right. To other different tissues. Exactly. And now we're looking at uh, fat tissue, but really yeah. like where, how would creatine have an impact in, in fat tissue? And that's, so if you're uh, listening to this, I'm throwing up a graphic now that of kind of, the different the the system by which mitochondria have this impact in terms of energy production so 
Alec even said it in the most you know basic biology course that you that people take. What do people associate the mitochondrion with? They associate with it's the powerhouse of the cell. I mean, people throw it in my face all the time as a joke. Um, it gets annoying, by the way, <laughs> just just so people know. Uh, but in the fat cell, that's no different. That's exactly what it does. Uh, however, this production of energy can also be helped or this kind of metabolism that occurs within the fat cell can be helped by creatine. And why is that? And that's, that's really what they're trying to get at. Why, why does creatine have a particular effect on fat? And we're going to see that it has a specific effect on a particular type of fat that may not be found in other fats. So do you want to touch on, on that a little bit more in kind of the, the system? Yeah, for sure. I think, I, I mean, I think we're at this point, like we're, tr we're getting a little bit too far in the paper before discussing the figures. So do you okay. want to start like breaking down the figures? Because there's like, I think we're, we're um, and the reason why we're jumping ahead is because there was a reason they decided to chase creatine mm -hmm. in brown adipose tissue okay. um, or, or brown adipose um, fat, for example. Yeah. Um, so, so what they did, so in this paper, one of the first ways or the, the way in which they tried to distinguish between the brown and the beige adipose tissue is by doing this technique known as proteomics, uh, mass spec and, and proteomics, in which they pretty much try to uh, determine uh, the differences that exist or the types of proteins that these two different tissues express, right, which can give insight into... Um, the machinery or the enzymes, like the, the metabolism behind these cells and what uh, these cells seem to prefer to rely on. Or, or like it gives insight into essentially how these two different tissues function and why they're potentially different, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I said that there's two different distinct phenotypes that exist in these. And so what they did is, is through proteomics, they realized or they found out that uh, when compared to brown adipose tissue, the beige adipose tissue had a a um, high expression of proteins that were responsible for creatine uptake, as well as responsible for the ability for the mitochondria or for the ATP that was being produced to be able to be shuttled to um, the creatine molecule to produce phosphocreatine, right? So in this beige adipose tissue, they had the machinery in place um, to um, essentially drive um, ATP production toward generating fossil creatine, right? Um, and, and, and it's kind of puzzling because as I mentioned, that in and of itself for muscle, when we think about it, like it from an energetic perspective, that is mainly used because there needs to, there's immediate work that needs to be done, right? So it's a reserve so that immediate energy can be done um, and it increases your high intensity work capacity, if we can call it. But with brown adipose tissue, it's not needed, right? There's no, you know, it's, it's not what you, you don't, it's not necessary for it to have it in there. So it kind of begs the question is why does this, this, or sorry, beige adipose tissue, it begs the question is why does this exist? Why does there need to be this upregulation of creatine metabolism in beige, adip in beige adipose tissue specifically? Because it wasn't found in brown adipose tissue, but only in beige adipose tissue. So that was the big question. Is that so? The, so in this paper, Figure One was pretty much delineating and figuring out that the creatine metabolism or the the machinery responsible for promoting creatine metabolism was higher in the beige adipose tissue stores from these mice. Right. So they saw a key protein specific to creatine metabolism, but they Correct. they also saw increases in uh, kind of general mitochondrial proteins like. Uh, ATP yes. synthase and complex two and yep. you know just different different proteins that play a critical role in yep. mitochondrial function in yep. in line with also a creatine like creatine kinase so the reason why I threw this graphic up here earlier um, which I didn't even touch on it because I went on my own rant um, that <laughs> there's this enzyme that's found inside the mitochondria and um, at kind of this this middle section of the mitochondrion there's there's two walls that make up a mitochondrion and you've got the outer wall they get creative with the names and they got the inner wall 
And between those two walls, there's this enzyme called creatine kinase. And uh, Alec has talked about it a few times, kind of indirectly talking about this conversion of having creatine, having a phosphate that's added onto it. Well, that is mediated by this protein, this kind of, uh, you can think of it, well, maybe not a master protein, but it is a protein that does do exactly that. It, it sticks a phosphate from the ATP molecule and just takes it from there. It's like, oh, you, you, don't, you don't need this anymore and throws it onto the uh, creatine molecule making the phosphocreatine. And then from there, then you have elevated levels of this kind of charged creatine. Like it's ready to donate that phosphate back to a spent molecule known as ADP. And that's important because the mitochondrion is responsible for recycling that ADP back to ATP. And it does that through uh, a series of different proteins that are in line called the electron transport chain. And I'm not going to go into like all the intricacies of the electron transport chain and whatnot. All you need to really know is that you have this conversion through the ETC, the electron transport chain, from ADP to ATP. And that actually generates heat. Like there's, there's, there's heat that's associated with um, the general energetics that are associated with the mitochondrion. And the creatine molecule is going to potentially play a role in that whole process. And that's what they're trying to get at um, through, throughout this paper. So, so you explained figure one, you kind of explained that overall, that there's a protein yeah, difference. As for why we're chasing creatine. Yeah, exactly. Or why they, sorry, why they chase creatine. I did none of this work. Okay. So the second part of a five part paper, the second part yep. there, they then look at beige fat and they're going to look at UCP expression, which they uh, talked about. Well, you talked about UCP. So can, can you go a little bit more into detail with what UCP is? Like what, what makes it special um, by comparison to kind of just a regular mitochondria? Um, okay. So, well, so let's go, actually, let's go back to that. Can you go back to your figure real quick? Sure. Okay. So, so in this figure here, um, you break it down so that the end of uh, the electron transport chain is the the use of all of these like these protons, the hydrogens that exist, um, and there's this gradient that essentially is um, that that essentially releases energy. So once the the, the hydrogen is allowed to go down this this gradient, uh, it produces energy to allow us to be able to take ADP and slap on a phosphate to create ATP. Um, so in mo so what we previously thought was that this is always happening, right? So that the um, this proton motive force, the ability for you or the, the, the uh, protons that's produced or sent out from the electron transport chain to be then used is always going to be used to create ATP, right? right? But that's not actually the case. Um, so the brown adipose tissue is a perfect example of that because there is not a high need to continue to replenish ATP because its energy needs are very high. Like there's no, there's not a, a lot of work that's being done in this cell to require such a high, uh, demand of ATP. Relative what to actually, like a muscle or something like that. Compared to muscle, exactly. Um, but what actually there, so what actually exists in this uh, inner mitre, on this inner mitochondrial wall, as you mentioned, is this protein known as UCP1. And what that actually does is it's another way in which we can shuttle those protons that we're producing from the ETC, um, but it doesn't, it's not ATP linked, right? So it's just being used or just a way in which we can funnel protons through, right? So I think it's important to know is that the electron transport chain, the reason it's called that, that is because all of the carbons and all the things, all of the, the stuff that makes up food, right? It's being broken down and metabolized and sent off to this. So pretty much the rate at which this thing works, the rate at which this thing can flux through carbons and electrons um, dictates our energy expenditure, right? Mm -hmm. And so the faster we can move through it, the more energy we're going to expend. And usually if we don't, it, it, you know, if, if it's all dependent on our ability to produce or our need for ATP, then we can't move through it very quickly. 
But if there's another way in which we can kind of use it almost fu- like in a, in, a, in a feudal sense, then you can artificially ramp up energy expenditure. And UCP1 is a pretty much is a great way of being able to do that because there's no endpoint, right? There's no blockade. There's no like it's it's just it uses the hydro it uses those those protons um, for no reason, right? So, but it, it continue. But it, what it, the the purpose of it is allows the electron transport chain to continue to work even when there's not a specific demand for ATP at that time. Right. So if you think of like a, a car revving at really high RPM, that's going to generate a lot of heat. <laughs> yes. if, you, if you get really simplistic with it, and that's essentially what's happening in this kind of biological process. So, yep. and the creatine is somehow going to play a role in this entire kind of hodgepodge of different systems that are trying to generate energy and generate heat and all these different things. Yep. Okay, so beige fat has this UCP expression. Um, which makes it unique from the white fat that we talked about earlier. Um, Because white fat tends to have lower mitochondria, also tends to have less uh, UCP in general. So then they're going, so then they use these, one way that they're able to measure the actual uh, energetics of the fat cells or the fat tissue is by looking at oxygen consumption. So that ETC, that electron transport chain, uses uh, oxygen to drive itself, to to, to be working in general. So they can then use that as a proxy to then figure out the energy that's that's being used, being generated, etc., etc. So that's what they end up using multiple times throughout the paper. And just as a kind of a side reference, like if you were to go get your metabolism checked uh Mm -hmm. like at ecu right uh in one of the exercise physiology laboratories you could do that you could just measure the 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 breathing that you do and it would give you based on the exact same principle that it's a proxy measure of your mitochondria throughout your entire body in this in this situation it can give you an idea of the energy that you are expending within a particular window and then you can extrapolate from that um, just based off of the oxygen and the co2 that uh, that oxygen intake and uh, co2 that you're then emitting so they're doing this on a microscopic scale uh, looking at these fat cells and Mm -hmm. so they're looking at oxygen consumption and they're specifically looking at oxygen consumption in these different fats so looking at brown fat I don't have it up in front of me, but um, brown fat and beige fat. Is that is that right, yep. Alec? Yeah. Yep. Brown fat, beige fat, and heart. So not heart fat, but heart muscle. And they end up finding that if they add creatine to all three tissues, what ends up happening, that they see an increase in oxygen consumption only in the beige fat, which suddenly gives them a clue. Okay, something is going on here that is unique to the beige fat, but not happening in the brown fat or the the heart muscle. Yeah, no, that's um, yeah, that's pretty much on point. Is that the the big thing is that the creatine is driving energy expenditure, right? And and specifically in the beige adipose tissue, the beige the beige fat. Right. Yeah. I think I think that's a perfect takeaway from that one. Okay, so then the third part of the paper, uh, they go in, they you know dig a little deeper. Mm-hmm. So, do you want to discuss that a little bit about the sure. creatine? Yeah, we'll, we'll go through that. that. Yeah. So, um, so with any any sort of mechanism. Um, paper or when you're, when you're looking, when you're looking at mechanisms of science, um, you always have to figure out like how necessary the mechanism you're looking at is to, or or specific parts of the mechanism are to the overall whole. And the way you do that is um, you can either um, knock down or knock out specific genes that you think are playing a role in this mechanism, or you can add specific inhibitors or specific agonists that you also think um, or for the enzymes or proteins involved in the mechanism we're talking about. Um, so one of the things they decided to use in this paper is this compound known as beta GPA. And beta GPA is looks really structurally similar to creatine. 
but it's not creatine and cannot be used in the same way as creatine can be used in the cell. Um, so in fact, what it does is it actually acts as an inhibitor of creatine metabolism. So what this gets at is when they start throwing this into the, or when they start giving the animals this, um, this compound beta GPA, you can pretty much get an idea of when you knock out creatine metabolism, what mm -hmm. happens to overall energy expenditure, right? So the first thing they want to do is get a proof of concept. And they, what they found out is that when they included the beta GPA or when they gave these animals the beta GPA, it reduced the ability for the, for the animals to take up creatine, right? So great. Model work. Um, and some other things they wanted to look at was what effect did it have on other components of energy expenditure and body composition in general. So movement, for example, talked about how that was a big component and it did not influence um, the animals, how, how much they move throughout the day. So daily movement, uh, daily physical activity did not get in, in, impacted by this, nor did it impact food intake at all. But what it did impact was the oxygen consumption, right? So the so oxygen consumption, which, we, which Nick talked about previously, is synonymous really with energy expenditure, right? So what they found is that when you reduce or when you included this, this when you gave the animals this beta GPA, uh, it actually reduced their oxygen consumption, it reduced their energy expenditure. And then when you looked at that in, at, in tissue specific instances, right? So when you looked at the effect of beta, beta, beta GPA um, on tissue specific metabolism, the only tissue that was affected is the beige fat, right? So it had no effect on the brown adipose tissue, uh, the gastrocnemia, so a specific muscle in, in, uh, in the calf, for example. It only had an impact on the oxygen consumption or energy expenditure in the beijing adipose tissue, which is really fascinating. Again, kind of furthering the point that this, um, that the ability for creatine to drive energy expenditure uh, is dictated primarily by its effect in beige adipose tissue. Right. Yeah. So. And then another thing uh, that they mentioned, just just as a quick aside, is that they mentioned that other papers had used this this analog of creatine and that it yeah. had affected the movement and the eating habits of these animals. So they had used less and they ended up showing that it didn't. So which was great. Um, and but they still saw the effect, like you mentioned, in the beige fat. So it's like yeah. a perfect scenario. You're using less of the substance, so it's not affecting the animals in terms of their behavior, but it is affecting that tissue that you're specifically wanting to investigate. Yeah. And then from there, they look at human adipocytes, so human fat cells. Um, yeah. And they're, again, looking at this creatine analog, so they, they add this, um, this creatine mimicking uh, molecule, and they look at oxygen consumption in human quote-unquote brown fat which is which as alec more, mentioned more kind of beige fat, as we talked about because humans really don't have a lot of that brown fat if any at all right yeah so that's that kind of transition fat from the white fat to, to beige fat because we can't yep. end up creating uh, brown fat at least as far as we know so far so um they end up showing that this uh creatine analog then reduces oxygen consumption in those human cells as well. So now we're not just looking at mice, we're not just looking at mouse cells, we're also looking at human cells. So we're starting to get yeah. kind of a little bit of that crossover. And unfortunately, I think that's kind of the maximum they go in terms of the crossover, because they're really just trying to tease out kind of the mechanism for how creatine has this effect. But ultimately, what we know at this point is that this creatine analog, if you block creatine, it starts to affect the oxygen consumption of, and in this situation, that's a proxy for mitochondrial function. Okay, great. So then yeah, this, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I know. Um, I think the other thing just to point out too, is they, so because they were able to do uh, cell specific work here, they also were able to knock out, um, the creatine kinase so the, the enzyme that's necessarily that's responsible for using atp to generate the phosphocreatine uh they were able to knock that down in these cells yeah so perfect yeah the perfect example here um they were able to knock that down in these cells and that had a very similar effect to when you blocked creatine uptake with the beta gpa um 
indicating that like the, the compound itself wasn't necessarily having the effect, but rather it's it's the um, it's how blocking creatine uptake and feeding into that creatine kinase or that 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 creatine cycle um, is really the big player here. That's that's the most important factor uh, involved, and I think that's also important too, just because we know like creatine in and of itself has uh, when it's brought into the cell has different effects on osmolarity. It's a you know it's a rather large molecule can bring water into the cell, which can have a um, other like you know uh, yeah off target like, effects yeah off target effects as well. Great, I'm just trying to think of the word for that, but um, but yeah off target effects as well. So I think seeing that you're 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 having the same effect between knocking out the enzyme that we think is responsible as well as the substrate that is that we think is responsible and seeing that they're the effects are synonymous. Um, really drive home the point that it all centers around the creatine cycle. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. It's a it's a great addition, absolutely. Um, so then the fourth part of this paper looks at, and we mentioned this earlier, UCP, so this uncoupling protein. Yep. Um, so they end up, and Alec was talking about these different manipulations of what we can do, um, so scientists can actually knock out particular proteins as long as it doesn't end up being lethal to that animal or that cell line or whatever it might be. So um, right. for this particular situation, they actually generate, um, so they actually knock out, so they completely get rid of this particular protein, UCP, in these animals. And yeah. it's a little finicky. They do mention that if you... Uh, what they the way that they test this is by actually decrease massively decreasing the temperature of a room uh, w that the mice are being kept in, and normally with their UCP they'd be able to generate heat. Uh, it, it wouldn't be an issue, and they'd be able to do it very quickly. But what they found in other papers is that if you do it too quickly, the mice die. So. They have to have a slow, gradual process where they slowly lower the temperature over days, and then these mice apparently do survive. So that's actually fantastic because then uh, they can actually test and actually do tests and see what's happening with um, when this UCP is, is knocked out. And the UCP knockout, uh, these mice, ends up relying on creatine to create kind of an alternative thermogenesis, thermogenesis being heat generation, uh, that is independent of this UCP. Because clearly, I mean, there's there's no other way. Like the UCP has been removed, and yet they're still able to generate heat. So there's something going on there that's, that's independent of UCP. And um, so at this point, they're starting to get more into this nitty gritty of specifically creatine potentially having an impact. Um, and they see increases in uh, creatine kinase as well as the transporter of creatine that allows creatine to be shuttled um, in the mitochondria. So anything yeah. else you want to add? Yeah, so the, the big thing being is that, so they, um, they used two different things to kind of test this, to figure out, I guess, the synergism that potentially existed between the UCP1 mechanism to generate heat or the adaptive thermogenesis that happens when you when you climatize animals into or when you put place animals into cold environments mm -hmm. um so the adaptive so what's contributing generally to the adaptive thermogenesis and uh, is ucp1 dependent on creatine is creatine dependent on ucp1 and what they found is that these two things actually um work separately right and there's a compensatory mechanism by which if you block one the other goes up and if you block the other, then the other one goes up. So what they did here is they utilized that that beta uh, GPA, so to block the creatine metabolism. And when they what they found is that when you did that, UCP one expression went up and allows the the animals to to maintain core body temperature when uh, challenged with the cold, um, or when when given the cold challenge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then when you um, knocked out UCP one, right? Uh, you still were able to have that compensatory, you still were able to go through adaptive thermogenesis, but when you added that beach, the, the beta GPA on top of the UCP1 knockout, the animals could not maintain core body temperature. So what that tells us is that these are two distinct mechanisms that exist in these tissues, but, and if you knock one out, the other one goes up, 
Um, but if you knock both of them out, then the animal does not have the ability to undergo adaptive thermogenesis. Yeah. So yeah, both of them are, are um, so what it tells us is that both of them are important for adaptive thermogenesis, uh, but for whatever reason, the animals seem to rely, or at least in the brown adipose tissue, they seem to rely more heavily on this creatine shuttle as shown by the proteomics. Um, as shown by like the, the, the advanced expression of the creatine um, or creatine metabolism proteins that exist in the beige adipose tissue specifically. Right, which we uh, covered in the first part of, of this yep, study. Exactly. Um, another addition is just so that everybody's aware that with heat generation, you're talking about an increase in metabolism. Um, anytime you're trying to generate more heat, I mean, you're going to be increasing the amount of energy that you're yeah. expending. So yeah. another culprit that they thought maybe, and this happens with humans and everybody experiences it, if you get cold, you shiver. And that shivering is not your fat cells shivering, it's your muscle cells. They're, yeah. they're quivering. So they ended up testing that and they found that there was no difference. So the muscle mm -hmm. cells were not able to were not the explanation for why these animals were able to maintain their body temperature. So then yeah. now they're really honing in that the culprit is these uh, fat cells, uh, as, as Alec pointed out. So yeah. they're, so it's, it's not, their shivering didn't change. So it's non shivering thermogenesis is responsible for what's going on. Okay. So then for the final part, uh, part five, um, here, this was, to me, it felt a little bit off, it felt a little strange, um, but uh, they end up looking at a variety of different enzymes, which enzymes are proteins um, that are have a particular structure that allow them to do different things within the cells. And in this situation, they're looking at a phosphatase. They're looking at, I think all of the proteins that they looked at, right, were phosphatases, which a phosphatase... Oh, yeah. Official, can you bring up that like old um, mitochondria figure again for the, for sure. the folks? All yeah. Right. So yeah, the so the uh, yeah, so generally speaking, um, just kind of one of the main things that drives reactions, right? So we're talking about any of these, like so, a, all the arrows that Nick has on this figure here are all deemed reactions, right? Reactions and or transport mechanisms that exist. And a lot of those are driven by the concentration or the amount of the, of the, um, of the reactants. So the things that are like the beginning part of the reaction or what you're trying to transport out and what's on the opposite end. So the products and or the thing that's on the opposite end of the transporter, right? So say for example, you have too much of the product, right? then there is actually the, the, the enzymes have an ability to sense that so that it reduces the, the rate at which that reaction occurs because clearly you've done enough. That reaction has done its job. It's produced enough of the product so there's no need for it to continue on, right? Um, so the same, that, that rationale or that, I guess, concept also works for the creatine kinase mechanism. So say, for example, you know, you have enough of this ATP being produced, shuttled out so that creatine kinase could use it to produce phosphocreatine, right? But if enough phosphocreatine is being produced, then creatine kinase will have no reason to continue on producing phosphocreatine. So then if that's the case, then by adding more creatine to this, or uh, sorry, um, then there's like then there has to be a blockade. There has to be like an end point to which, um, how am I trying to describe this? There pretty much ha there, there has to be a way, um, in which, uh, <laughs> I don't know. You got you got a way to help me out, man. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of a better way to describe this. Um, a way to make the futile cycle. Is that what you're Pretty much, about? yeah. In order to keep the cycle going before enough of the phosphocreatine builds up, right? So that so that the cross phosphocreatine being produced doesn't inhibit the rest of the cycle. It pretty much there needs to be a way in which you can allow the cycle to continue on without phosphocreatine building up. I think that's the best way to probably describe it right now. 
I see what you mean. Right. Yeah. Right. So you but can't just keep loading the cells with with exactly. creatine. You just can't keep exactly. like just stuffing creatine in there yep. and then allowing creatine kinase to continuously uh, yep. add phosphates to it. Because the, the cell, I mean, has a finite amount of room and it will explode. I mean, it also won't yep. allow that to happen. And it, so, and especially it was especially important about this too is that, um, like I mentioned, there is no real need for these adipose cells to have phosphocreatine, right? They're yeah. not, they don't have this like, this um, demand of immediate work to need this energy system uh, to be as robust as, as it is in these cells, right? So therefore there needs to be a way to expend that phosphocreatine so that it does not build up and inhibit this creatine cycle from working, right? right. And, and, and inhibit from uh, us being able to, um, you know, use this ATP that's being produced so readily. Um, so therefore, in order to block that from happening, right, there needs to be a way in which you hydrolyze or break up that phosphocreatine so that it once again is a phosphate group and creatine, right? So the the way in which so the, the the way in which that happens is we have enzymes in our cells known as phosphatases. And those are specifically responsible for taking away that the phosphate off of various molecules or uh, various proteins, molecules, whatever, in the cell, right? And that's what they believed was responsible for uh, continuing this feudal creatine cycle. So there was some, there was some enzyme, there's some phosphatase that was cleaving off the phosphate from creatine so that the creatine could be replenished and continue on that reaction, continue that and allow for that reaction to continue on, right? Um, so in order to do this, they screened for a bunch of different phosphatases via that, that proteomics approach in um, these different um, adipose cells or adipose tissues. Uh, and what they found is there's this phospho-1. So there's this specific phosphatase they found that to be highly upregulated in brown, brown, brown adipose tissue specifically. Um, and that when you actually knock this out, it had a very similar energy expenditure phenotype compared to when you knocked out or when you blocked creatine metabolism, as we talked about previously, right? So by so without this specific phosphatase, it resembled um, the exact same energy energy expenditure phenotype as what you saw when you inhibited creatine uptake, for example, with that beta GPA, or by blocking or knocking knocking out. Um, the creatine kinase, right? So that told us that that told these guys that this is probably the enzyme responsible for the for perpetuating this feudal creatine cycle. Um, but what was interesting though is that when they did um, like when they looked at the, the specific activity, right? So then when they did like an enzyme kinetics assay in which they saw like how um, the ability for this phosphatase to specifically when they gave it fossil creatine kind of in a vacuum, um, that it actually had a very low affinity for phosphocreatine. So it had a very low ability to actually cleave the phosphate off of creatine, um, which means that there must be some other reactions that phosphocreatine is linked to that eventually leads to this phospho or this, that, uh, that eventually leads to this phosphatase. Um, but it's not a direct one-to-one, -one, right? There has to be something else involved in order for this phosphatase to be able to work on the creatine cycle, but it's not on phosphocreatine uh, specifically. Right. If that, hopefully that, that there's, there's a lot of, a lot of pieces there, but hopefully that made sense. Yeah. So, and they specifically saw this phosphatase uh, upregulated as in there's more yep. of this phosphatase yep. when they knocked out UCP. So when UCP wasn't around and the fat cells are looking for some way to survive or some way to generate heat, then they turn to this gene that creates this particular phosphatase. And they're like, okay, start reading that a lot. And that's exactly what they saw. But they looked at all these other phosphatases and they did not see that effect. So that's how they ended up relying or looking at this particular phosphatase, as, as Alec pointed out. Um, however, that's right. So they, they thought that initially, and I'll throw a, another graphic up here, they have two different theories on this. So their initial theory, and this is actually straight from the paper, if you're watching the, the podcast, but again, you, you don't have to be watching to, to understand, hopefully, hopefully we're doing a good enough job um, breaking things down. But what, what uh, Alec was talking about was this figure A 
So looking at this uh, removal of this phosphate from the, the phosphocreatine molecule, then freeing up creatine to do what it's supposed to be doing, uh, kind of creating what's called the futile cycle. Um, however, they also post postulated that it's possible that this phosphatase has an impact or has its effect uh, on another molecule, on a completely different molecule, which um, there's also, based on other evidence, so other papers have shown that there's increases in another molecule known as phosphoethanolamine, amine, uh, that reduces mitochondrial respiration. So again, going back to the oxygen that we talked about earlier, uh, how that's a proxy for, for energy, and that this particular molecule reduces mitochondrial respiration by inhibiting the electron transport chain, which is what we've been talking about that actually uh, you know, generates ATP and whatnot, generates energy. And it turns out that that molecule is a substrate, so that is one of the molecules that fits in really well with this phosphatase enzyme. So this enzyme, as Alec used the word affinity, has an affinity, actually likes this particular molecule and will actually act on that molecule. So it'll take off the phosphate of that molecule. And then they, they were implying that it's possible that this, um, that this phosphatase is upregulated because it's uh, having an alternative effect that's different from um, the one that they were proposing with creatine. But that's that's a different story. That's like a side quest in a video game. <laughs> it's it's not a, it's not exactly related to this overall story of of creatine. So yeah, so overall though, they're saying that something at some point, even though they never actually end up discovering what is taking off is probably, I mean, let's be real, it's probably yeah. happening because they don't actually mm -hmm. show full proof yet. Um, but based off of their ideas is that it's probably taking off that phosphate. Something is taking off a phosphate from the phosphocreatine, then replenishing creatine to have that creatine kinase then slap on another phosphate and then drive um, increases in uh well, I was looking at it as increases in ADP, which is a low energy state for the adipocyte, um, which then allows the adipocyte to go through and use, to go through the ETC, go through the electron transport chain and regenerate more ATP. Thereby, overall, this whole reaction is generating heat that would be independent of what UCP would be uh, doing if uh, it were present. Yeah. And I think I, I think something we should have probably touched on earlier, um, but is important to note is that all of these reactions that we're talking about, the reason like specifically when, when we're talking about like movement through the electron transport chain, um, we're saying all these things are tightly linked, but there's always a level of inefficiency that exists. So the energy transfer from one reaction to another, from one reaction to drive another reaction, like, for example, the um the flux of the of the protons down their gradient to generate atp all of these things are not perfectly efficient so the reason they're producing heat is because some of the energy that's released that is going to generally do like chemical work is also um being you or, or is also being i guess um released as heat so just by mass action, by the amount of these things that are going on, there is a significant amount of heat being produced. So if you can ramp up respiration, whether that is linked to ATP or whatever, if you're just, if you're just increasing the flux that's existing in the electron transport system, then you are, as a byproduct product, generating more heat, right? So just flux in general, movement in general, being able to send more things through this ETC, there is already, an, just by the in and of itself, there is an increase in heat generation. Yeah. That I mean, was just, I, just something to bring up. I think something could be uh, kind of miss. We just almost let it like, yeah, heat being generated. That's kind of what we just said. So I think it's important to note that it's generated because there's inherent inefficiencies in these, in these networks that exist. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a good point to touch on. Um, Ultimately, though, the this is like it's it's very much like a car that's stuck. Like you got 
the parking brake on, you're slamming on the, the brakes yourself, and then you're revving yeah. the engine. Um, you're, the RPM is increasing. You're not actually going anywhere. I mean, these are fat cells. They're, they're not actually producing anything like muscle cells to actually move you. They're just sitting there and they're just generating heat. So if you were to put your hand on the hood of a car that's just been sitting there and just revving nonstop, it'd be generating yeah. heat. It's the exact same principle here, just in a biological manner. Yep. So kind of the big takeaway, let's, let's discuss that and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, yeah. So the main mechanism is in adaptive thermogenesis, so this kind of ad adaptation and increases in heat production, which again is highly, highly related to metabolism. It's highly related to the generation of energy, the use of energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in beige adipose tissue, and Alec talked about the differences, right? We were talking about white fat a little bit at the beginning, but more specifically a difference between brown fat and beige fat that humans might be able to generate this beige fat from white fat, so this kind of transition from white fat to beige fat, but yeah. we can't do the brown fat like with animals, um, except when we're infants. I think you mentioned that earlier. Um, so this adaptive thermogenesis in beige adipose tissue or uh, beige fat in humans is driven by a futile creatine cycle of this constant exchange of these phosphates just going back and forth, back and forth, that's allowing for this drive and this generation of heat um, where ATP is produced is immediately used in the cycle, uh, keeping ADP levels elevated. Again, going back to that kind of futile cycle. So anything you want to kind of add as kind of closing remarks yeah i, I think the so well, just to, i i think this really gets at what happens when it is beige mm -hmm. and what drives its um its heat production generally so the thermogenesis is is derived from this paper primarily by this fetal creatine cycle right. but going from the transition point from going from white to, to this beige phenotype it's not necessarily dictated by this, right? No. So no. we just don't have to get there, right? Mm -hmm. But the actual driving factors that play a role from going from white to beige, um, there's been a lot of other studies to suggest how that happens. Um, and, and cold is one of them. That's a great stimulus. But also um, adrenergic uh, stimulation. So a lot of the, uh, like the catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, for example, um, that seems to play a role in this conversion of white to bra uh, white to beige. But that's a totally different topic. What we kind of touched on is really how to drive the adaptive thermogenesis or what drives the adaptive thermogenesis in this beige adipose tissue, uh, which, like we mentioned, has a high clinical relevance for humans. And that seems to be based, that seems to be driven by the fetal creatine cycle. And if you increase the concentration of creatine that is brought into the cell, then um, that seems to increase or artificially drive uh, energy expenditure, right? Um, so, which kind of, and, and I think, um, I, I don't know where they at or, or the, where they're at in this, but it's actually one of the, um, the grants that has come off of this study. So um, one thing I didn't mention one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this paper is because I actually got a chance to meet uh, Bruce Spiegelman when he taught, when he spoke at Duke, uh, I think it was last year. Um, and it, this was the topic of the conversation. And one of the future routes that he was taking at the time was essentially giving, so people that were having trouble uh, with weight maintenance, he was going to give them creatine supplementation to see if that impacted their adaptive thermogenesis or their energy expenditure um, in their, well, supposedly in their beige adipose tissue. But they were going to see if, if creatine essentially was a, a potentially useful therapeutic um, to drive energy expenditure. Did he, think is quite bad. did he talk at all about um, how relevant beige adipose tissue is, just kind of generally, just kind of standing? I mean, if you don't have an actual forced transition, then how how present is beige adipose tissue? Did he talk about that at all in his talk? Um, I don't, he, he might've, but I think, I think it's more based on the, I, I, I'm trying to say this as like, not PC as I can, but if you have more fat in general, then by 
and like you're also going to have just because of you know more, mass more action beige. you're probably also have more beige fat as well. Okay. So yeah. this mechanism is probably going to be more um, apparent in individuals with a larger store of adipose tissue um, because they'll probably also have more beige adipose tissue as well. Okay, so letting our scientific excitement take hold and us throwing away any sort of caution, we, we would say then, if that were true, that a person who is, is overweight, the more overweight a person is, the more benefit they would get from creatine supplementation in this context. In, the, in this context. Yeah. But so a leaner individual would get less benefit um, from this context, unless they found some way to convert their white adipose tissue to beige adipose tissue. Which is, I mean, th theoretically, that's also possible because right. the stim like I said, stimulation for the conversion, right, is going to be happening more so in individuals who, for example, are readily exercising because mm -hmm. they're constantly getting that beta adrenergic stimulation from exercise or from the physical activity they're doing. So by that in and of itself compared to sedentary people they will have more of a drive toward um toward that beijing of the white adipose tissue okay yeah great um we totally just said that off the cuff so <laughs> definitely don't hold yeah, us to I, that because there needs yeah. to be a lot of research that actually confirms what we just said <laughs> merely <laughs> was, yeah merely hypothetical <laughs> yeah i hear you Okay, well, um, that was our discussion of creatine and its impact on, um, on fat tissues, various types of fat tissues, but more specifically, beijing uh, fat or tissue that has uh, beiged, that has gone from white to, to, to beige. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting paper. Um, and I was really happy that Alec was able to bring that to my attention because I didn't know about it. Um, so now I know just a little bit more about creatine. Hopefully other people feel like they've learned a little bit more about creatine, uh, aside from the muscle aspect, the performance aspect that we touched on earlier as well. And uh, with that, be sure to check out Alec's podcast, which is the Physiology Forum. I'll have that linked uh, so that people can check that out. Uh, it's definitely a lot of science breakdown, uh, talking about papers, but I think one of the cool things that uh, he mentioned at the beginning is that they do end up talking to actual experts. They talk about the to the people that uh, were involved in the research, the hands-on research, which is like the coolest thing ever. That's like the best, best possible scenario. So uh, be sure to check that out and see if it's your cup of tea if you want even more depth uh, in, into the science of things. And thanks for being on the podcast as always, Alec, it's always fun to talk You're science asking. with you and, uh, a pleasure. yeah. And hopefully anybody that was listening, hopefully your eyes didn't cross <laughs> from, from us going a two, two molecular two, two, uh, cellular biology, but hopefully you, you gained something out of it. And, uh, I will catch you in the next one. Have a good one guys. See ya. See you guys later.